Good afternoon, everybody. We will get started in about a minute. Uh, for now, you can answer our, our poll question of what is security. I like how we've gone from hell to wearing a cool hat to the latest iteration of Broadway theater manifest as rapid illustrations of safety followed by the feeling of despair. When your main site dies only to realize that it was a typo by your intern after management decided to switch the, to the next tip, uh, technology their nephew read on the internet. I think we've all been there. <laughs> at least I've been there at some point, maybe. And now it got very quiet, so I feel like I should just start. <laughs> okay, fine. Well, welcome. This is the security team presentation. Uh, yeah. Oh, are you waving to somebody? Okay. <laughs> what are you <laughs> A little early for questions. Welcome. This is the security team presentation. Uh, we've got a large number of slides and a bunch of stuff to get through, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm going to come stand over here and reach like this and turn that on. Okay. So. What is security? And obviously the follow-up question is what makes something secure? And you know, we don't have a good answer for this, which is ironic because we're the security team. Um, we have lots of answers of things that help make things secure, but there really isn't any one single thing that makes something absolutely secure. Um, when we think about security, there's a lot of definitions for this. Uh, yeah, I don't think these are any of the definitions we would use, maybe awareness of risk. The, the typical definition we use is, the, is what's called the CIA triad. CIA is not refer, referencing a government agency here in the US. It's referencing three areas of security, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Um, but there's lots of answers here, and it, it ultimately depends on your organization. Uh, I'm here today working with the Drupal security team. All of us are members, with the exception of Tim on the end. Tim is, is with the DA. Um, we're a, vol we're a group of volunteers who work to improve the security of the Drupal project as a whole. Come on in, find some space. We've got some room at the table up front where we were all sitting earlier. So currently the security team has 29 full team members and five provisional team members. Uh, they come from everywhere and they come from all different you know, use cases of Drupal, from agency work to nonprofits. Uh, to for-profits, to education. So for the security team members that are up here, I'd kind of like to go through and do a little bit of introductions here because it's nice to know who you're talking to. Uh, my name is Michael Hess. Uh, my favorite vulnerability is probably SQL injection just because you can do so much fun stuff with it. Um, Neil, you got to turn your mic on. Uh, on top. Uh, yeah, I'm Neil Drum. Uh, I guess uh, storage cross-site scripting, because uh, then not, you can pivot that to do more interesting things like SQL injection as, <laughs> uh, as an admin. Um, I'm Angie Byron. Uh, you guys both took my answers. I'm going to go with um, social engineering. That's a lot of fun. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, using your charm and your wits about you in order to infiltrate your way into a, an organization and then you can do, you don't need SQL injection or CSRF because you just grab the database on a USB stick and walk out. Hi, I'm Benji Fisher, um, provisional member of the team. And uh, since all the good ones have been taken, I'll, I'll say um, insecure components or, or not, not keeping your software up to date because it's, it's sort of like brushing your teeth. You know you should do it, but are you? Have, have you seen these slides? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and Tim, you can go. You can go. As the non-security team member, but member of the Drupal Association and helping to secure Drupal.org's infrastructure, I'm going to go with my favorite vulnerability being uh, supply chain or dependency resolution vulnerabilities where a malware package can be introduced into something secondarily installed on your software stack. Thank you, everybody. So we have 29 full team members. I've put some of their avatars up here. Some of these avatars and pictures of them are very, very, very out of date. Uh, <laughs> like in this example, I still have hair. Uh, we won't go there. Um, you know, we have people who volunteer on the security team, but we also have organizations that in some manner sponsor work on the security team. Um, and so what this is, is this is a listing of organizations that were credited on four or more security advisories 
between yesterday and a year ago yesterday, because yesterday is when we ran the query for this. Woo. So thank you for these organizations. So lots of things that the security team does do and some things that we don't do. And so I've got kind of a slide here to help coordinate and help you know set some expectations of what the security team does and doesn't do. I'm gonna move this microphone. This was not designed for somebody who likes to move around when they talk. Um, we, we, you know, the primary thing we do is we help coordinate uh, disclosure to help keep Drupal secure. So if you get those emails on Wednesday, that is the primary thing we do. Um, and obviously it's not just the emails. The emails are actually the easy part of the process. It's all the work that happens prior to the emails of coordinating that issue. Um, we help with security related Drupal initiatives, making sure that uh, we have resourcing and that we've coordinated resources and if, if larger organizational need is brought into it, we help with that aspect. Um, we will help sometimes advise other open source security teams. We've been doing this a long time. Uh, I think 2004 or 2005, somewhere in there is when the security team was for 2005, uh, was when the security team was formally started. Um, and so we've been doing this a long time. We've got a lot of policies and a lot of procedures in place and we often coordinate with other open source teams on how to handle some of their bigger issues or how to get started. Um, we've worked with GitLab on, or I'm sorry, GitHub on some of their security issues and kind of the formatting of that. We've been an advisory member there. Uh, we've also done some coordination with Google and other open source content management systems around, you know, Google's brought us all together to kind of solve some common problems. Um, you know, we do some other things in here, but these are the main things that we are after as a security team in general. We also have some misconceptions around things that people think we do, but we don't do. Um, we do not proactively search for vulnerabilities in code. Uh, we have 29 people, we do not sit around and you know, read every piece of code committed to drupal.org. Um, I, I think that would be untenable for an individual to do. Uh, there are team members on our team that actually do, do code review, but it's not a primary goal of the team itself. And despite emails of please to do so, we do not fix your sites when they are compromised. We are often interested in finding out how they get compromised, but we don't help repair a damaged site. Uh, that's what your backups are for. You, you are keeping backups, right? <laughs> so the primary tool set that we use for, for doing vulnerability remediation is something known as coordinated disclosure. And coordinated disclosure is exactly what it sounds like. It's getting all the parties on the same page, figuring out how we're going to address a problem, addressing it, and then letting the world know at the same time. Uh, the, the inverse of coordinated, disclo coordinated disclosure might be a zero day where somebody just says, hey, there's a security issue, <laughs> here. Um, that's bad, we don't want that to happen uh, for a lot of reasons. Coordinated disclosure is a lot of work. There's a fairly complex workflow that goes behind this. Uh, effectively, we get a vulnerability that gets reported to the team and we do an initial triage of that vulnerability. Um, if the vulnerability appears to be valid, we start working with the maintainer to figure out how to fix the vulnerability. We don't proactively fix the vulnerability ourselves. We work with the maintainer of that code piece, fix it, test it, and then eventually disclose it on a Wednesday. Um, we aim to do this around Wednesday at 4 p.m. UTC. Uh, we've got the fixes ready to go at this point, and it's just a matter of going through the effort of publishing the fixes and getting the releases out there. The goal of this is to allow people to apply their security updates at a predictable time without worrying if their sites are gonna break. Most of the time, the goal is security updates only contain the security update itself. So, for example, if we are doing a security update for a module, we will try not to actually fix, uh, not to actually apply the security update to new features that have been released or new features that have been made since the last release, but only to what was done on the last release. Effectively, in Git terminology, we check out the tag that was made, apply the fix there, and then release a new tag, bypassing anything that's in the pipeline. Sometimes this doesn't work for a variety of reasons, but that is the goal so that you're safe to apply that uh, version without actually having to 
you know, worry, well, what are all these new features going to be? What, what else is going to break? Now, obviously, in order for that to work, you need to be on the most current version of that module prior to the release or core. So the output of this in the end becomes a coordinated uh, uh, a security advisory, which we refer to as an SA, we abbreviate it. And you can subscribe to these under your user edit page under newsletters, which at some point will probably move off of there into another format. But there, that, that's where all the newsletters used to be, and I think we're the only one there yeah. now. Um, you can also view them on drupal.org at drupal.org slash security and drupal.org slash security slash contrib. Occasionally, we publish public service announcements. Public service announcements are just, you should be aware of this. Uh, they're not necessarily something you have to take immediate action on, and we don't typically handle those on Wednesdays. Our goal with coordinated disclosure is we do this on Wednesdays. Sometimes we have to do it on an off-cycle security release where we'll do something that isn't on a Wednesday, and typically that's when things happen beyond our control. When we issue a security advisory, we've got a lot of metadata attached to that security advisory. It's not just, hey, here's the fix. Uh, probably the most important thing is the risk score. Now, the risk scores are this you know, generic fictitious site and what the risk might be to a generic fictitious site. And obviously, what you're doing on your site is you know, you're going to have to figure out what that risk is with what you're doing on your specific site. But it gives you an idea of how, how critical this might be. Um, you know, it, it, is, it is a risk profile. So some of you are running sites that have highly sensitive information. Your risk profile is significantly higher. Some of you have sites that are effectively static brochure sites. Nobody's logging in. There's no user interaction. There's only one user. Your risks are most of the time lower as a result. Um, we keep track of who's worked on what issue, who actually fixed it, who actually reported it, and who on the security team helped coordinate the process. And that's tied into the issue credit system see the list of names and the companies from earlier in this presentation. Uh, we also have version fields and how to fix the problem in some generic text. Uh, just some stats because we get asked for them. In 2021, we had 10 core security advisories and 47 contrib. In 2020, 13 core and 38 contrib. OK, <laughs> moving onward. The end of Drupal 6, yes. Uh, Drupal 6 currently has Vendor provided support until October 2020, uh, 22nd of 2022. That's hard to say twice. Um, and so if you're still running Drupal 6, any, anybody still running Drupal 6? <coughs> okay, a couple people are still running Drupal 6. <laughs> uh, it's time to finally move off of Drupal 6. Um, which brings me to my next subject. How many people are running Drupal 7? Okay, that's, yeah, yes, we are still writing. So that, that's more than, can I get those hands again, actually? That's 85% of the room, 89% of the room. Um, so we've kind of, you know, originally Drupal 7, 7 was supposed to be end of life in uh, 2020. It got, uh, it got, or 2021, 2021. Uh, we bumped it a year to 2022, mostly because of COVID. Um, and we've now kind of changed this as opposed to continually bumping it. We are reevaluating that decision frequently. You can kind of see the Drupal 7 usage and the Drupal 8 and 9 usage, and they appear to be almost at that convergence point where, you know, we'd expect them to continue on that trend afterwards. Usage isn't the only thing we're making this decision on. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, factors that go into this, but ultimately in the end, this was a moral imperative to the project. Uh, the security team, Drees, the Drupal Association, and other concerned uh, folks met and talked about this and tried to figure out what do we do here, how do we handle this. And you know, ultimately, given the show of hands in this room, that's a pretty powerful sign that you know, I think we made the right call at this point. We, we will at some point need to end of life Drupal 7, um, but it, it, it has been extended for another year, and we will continue to reevaluate that as time goes on. Um, We'll announce in July whether or not we're going to bump it again. Uh, and so we've kind of moved from this thing of, well, you know, let's set a date and then let's continually like change the date to we're going to evaluate this annually based on use, need, and other factors. You know, one of the reasons for this is running software that's past end of life is really, really risky. 
Um, the security team isn't watching out for it. Uh, you're kind of just you know, over there running it and it's kind of just you know, doing its thing, but it becomes a larger and larger attack surface. Um, you know, large enterprises don't allow it. Uh, if anybody's got, you know, those scanners out there, they find end of life software and then you get emails saying, hey, you've got to take this off our network. Um, you know, the other problem with end of life software that, that's a larger factor here is they often have other components that is required for them to run that isn't part of the end of life itself. And so, you know, if Drupal 7 still required PHP 5.3, that's a problem. PHP 5.3 does not have any support from any vendor as far as I'm aware, and definitely not from the PHP project. You know, this is, a, this is from a site called Cyware, which tracks some of these things, and basically these are end of life products that got compromised in mass because they hadn't been updated. And so, you know, some of these are more serious than others. But you know, the bottom line here is running end of life or out of date software is not a good thing. Uh, what does this come down to? Update. You know, the minimum thing you can do is update. It's a little bit like brushing your teeth. You know, you put in a little bit of work and so you don't have to deal with a cavity later on. Um, I use this brushing teeth analogy a lot. Because uh, you know you do that daily work for you know four minutes, two minutes, even a minute every day. Hopefully, people are brushing their teeth for longer than a minute, um, and it prevents you from having to do a bunch of work when your site gets compromised. Uh, you know, if you're running the software and we send out those Wednesday emails, update the software. It's the easiest thing you can do. So. Some other things you're able to do in this sphere is if you're using Composer NPM, pin your dependencies. Uh, spe specify specifically the version of the software you want to be running so that your site doesn't accidentally upgrade to something that isn't insecure or something that breaks your site within a security window. Uh, there's been lots of, do you want to talk quickly about supply chain attacks since you brought it up? I mean, there have been quite a few. Um, some, well, some deliberate supply chain issues and some non-deliberate ones. I mean, even in the earlier days of NPM, do people remember the left pad situation, right? Like you have a deletion of a dependency that was used by hundreds of thousands of, of sites and suddenly they couldn't build anymore. And if people had committed deployment artifacts and all of these things, instead of relying on rebuilding them live from hot linking from whatever repository, their sites would still be up, right? And so, but instead, like, half of the modern JavaScript-based internet broke for like 36 hours or something like, right? And that wasn't even malicious e explicitly, right? And then, you know, the, the other issue here is if someone compromises an upstream dependency and releases a new version that is suddenly phoning home with database keys, right? Like you do not want to suddenly just accept that update on a regular cron run or something like that, yeah. right? We try and avoid these things and there's, there's more uh, to be said throughout the conference. There's a couple other talks. I don't know if you're gonna get to mention these or should I? I, I don't think they're in the slide deck. Cool. Okay, so um, uh, we're working on supply chain security for Drupal's package management and updating uh, in particular as part of automatic updates and the project browser initiative. So you'll hear more about this uh, in the Dries note, uh, you can go to Ted Bowman's uh, session, which is w also mm. Wednesday afternoon, I believe. It's That's in the it. schedule. That is in here. Yeah, okay. Um, but yeah, lots of good things that we can do to protect ourselves, but also just some good hygiene that what we yeah. should follow. P pin, pin your dependencies. Also, you've got an entire operating system running. You've got other things that are running your site. Make sure they're up to date as well. So keep track, you know, if you're hosting this yourself, keep track of your Apache versions, Nginx, PHP, Linux itself. All of these things increase the surface attack range for your site itself. Um, you know, the, the, you know the, this question here of, you know, keeping your, reducing your surface area and keeping your dependencies and code up to date, PHP 5.3, I was originally gonna say, hey, raise your hand if you're running PHP 5.3, but don't do that. <laughs> because you're pretty much telling me, although the DA did not print uh, companies on name badges this year, but if they had, you're telling me where I can go and attack because PHP 5.3 is pretty insecure at this point. Uh, it's missed a lot of security updates. It tells me that if you're running that, you're probably running older versions of kernels and other things. So just keep your stuff up to date. Um, anybody have any fun stories they want to share about up to dates or, or security best practices? 
fun stories? <laughs> <laughs> fun in quotes. Angie? I feel like I need more warning than that. I will probably pick a one. Uh, fun stories. I guess there's a famous Drupal vulnerability uh, that goes by its, uh, I'm going to get the name wrong. If I ch What's the right way to say it? SA05. That one. Uh, <laughs> SA Core 005. Uh, it was a famous one. It went by the tagline Drupal Get In back in the day. Um, what was interesting about that one is that we traced the commit that caused that issue to be introduced into Core, and Dries committed it at about 1 a.m. on January 1st. <laughs> so it was a really good lesson in being mindful of you know what you're doing when you might have had a few too many, and maybe just go to bed instead of working on Core. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I will tell you when that when that happened, I got calls from you know folks whose websites I was. Uh, in some way responsible for consulting with. And, you know, thank you for updating my site. I, I didn't update your site. <laughs> well, my site's patched, so I'm good, right? Did you patch your site? No, I didn't patch your site. Well, then who patched my... Yeah, you're not very good, no. You should assume that is compromised. One of the attack patterns actually with SQL injection at the time was to patch the site so that other people couldn't come in and get control of the site. So speaking of patching sites, what if you, in your time zone or in your team, you don't have the ability to be around on Wednesday and patch? Uh, one of the things that we are working on is a product that the Drupal Association and the security team are offering called Drupal Steward. And this is a service that basically allows for some delay in patching highly critical updates. Drupal Steward acts as a web application firewall um, and it, it protects your site from certain known vulnerabilities before the vulnerability is uh, disclosed and even before the update is released. Um, web application firewalls work like network firewalls, except they're, at, they're down the food chain. Basically, they look at the web request and they inspect it, and if it meets a certain pattern, they deny it. Um, this is a, a great way to protect your sites against known attack vectors, and in the case of Drupal Stewart, unknown publicly attack vectors. Um, Stewart closes the gap uh, between the security release and when you update your site for highly critical issues. That means your team doesn't necessarily have to be on alert to deploy a bunch of site changes quickly. Um, and for large multi-site installations in the enterprise where you know, it's not just as simple as, hey, let's apply the patch and, and push it out to all of our servers. There's often a more complex QA process. This can help with delaying that QA process. It does have some limitations, as everything has limitations. At the moment, it only applies to highly critical core uh, vulnerabilities. We may expand it in the future. Uh, there are some vulnerabilities that just can't be, uh, can't be protected against using a WAF rule. Um, and there's a lot of false positives at times. Uh, one of the things that we do with Drupal Steward is we actually run it in what's called alert mode so that we can figure out what the po false positives are in advance so they don't actually impact business traffic. How does it work? So security team is going to identify a vulnerability in its normal process that we think can be highly critical and mass exploitable. So here's an example of one. Uh, we figure out whether or not we can mitigate this with a web application firewall. And we can. And then when we release the PSA for all highly critical vulnerabilities, we typically release a, a public service announcement that says, hey, upcoming on this date, we are going to be releasing a highly critical vulnerability. Be aware. Um, we'll let you know whether or not Drupal Stewart actually can mitigate the problem. So the WAF rules get communicated to our partners into a, in a monitor-only mode. And... We get feedback, we do some refinements, and once we are ready to release, we do the release. Prior to doing that release, we switch this out of monitor-only mode into enforcement mode, and you've now got some protection against this between the time of release and the time it's updated. Now, this is a service. It's not offered for free. Uh, there's some pricing tiers to this. There are three tiers around this. I'm going to turn this over to Tim, who's going to talk about our pricing tiers. Yeah, um, the simplest way to understand this is that there are some platform level partners who've committed um, to cover everyone they host with. So uh, today, Aqua and Pantheon cover all the sites hosted on their platform. So if you're hosting with them, you are covered. 
Um, if you're working with another agency or if you are, own your own site, there is a community tier level and basically it's between $10 and $15 a month with some amount of usage-based traffic um, to put the WAF in place. It's a globally distributed uh, WAF application, so the performance should be good kind of where you are. And if necessary, there are ways that it can be configured in concert with a CDN. That's something you can talk to us about. Um, we tried to make it about as affordable as we can, um, and uh, all the proceeds we do make from it get reinvested back. So hopefully we'll take those and put them into either bounties or security hardening programs or other things that we would do with the security team. And I would say, as the early slide before we got to this pro product came, update, update, update is still the rule, right? This gives you, this lets you schedule your update. This says, hey, there's a firewall protecting me while the vulnerability's there, so I don't have to update the minute the release happens. But over the course of the next day, two, maybe week, you should still be, hey, doing your QA, making sure everything else is good and getting that update deployed, so. And, and just to be, to, to be clear on that, the, the code fix for these is always free and always distributed. Uh, this is a service that lets you delay applying that code fix. Um, oh, and I saw a question submitted via your Slido, which I don't know if you intended to take questions I that way. I did not. Uh, but one of the questions <laughs> that I saw there was, was about like how, how Steward works in terms of the WAF rules themselves. So the rules themselves are not shared publicly because they could be used to reverse engineer what the vulnerability was, right? So there you are routing through the service without direct transparency into those rules. That's a kind of a limitation of the way it works. Um, but that's also why we're coordinating together with the security team and the platform level partners to you know, check for false positives and things before we deploy. So anyway, happy to answer more questions about that if you want to reach out to the DA at some point afterwards. And we'll get there in one second. If you're interested in learning more, if you're a site owner and just want to sign up and see how this works, you can go right now to drupal.org forward slash Stuart and follow the process to sign up and, and, and engage your site in it. There is a 14 day free trial. Uh, if you're a potential partner, please email drupalsteward at drupal.org and uh, Tim or I, likely Tim, will get back to you uh, with any questions. Um, you know, Drupal Stewart's one way to apply updates quickly. The other way to apply updates quickly is automatic updates. Um, you know, the security team is working with the strategic initiative. Uh, the, uh, I'm just, uh, David Strauss. I just blanked on his name, I apologize. David Strauss is a security team member. Ted is a provisional team member. Uh, Ted has a presentation on Wednesday at 11 a.m. Uh, on getting ready for automatic updates in core and kind of what this is gonna look like and how it's gonna work and how it's gonna pull in the, comp uh, the composer dependencies and all, all the mechanics that go around there. One of the things that we're doing here is we're actually investing time and energy into a update framework um, and you know, that could be used by multiple projects. Uh, Neil, do you want to talk about that a little bit as I'm putting you on the spot with no warning? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the basic idea of automatic updates is uh, being able to automate Composer uh, and also verify uh, cryptographically what Composer is doing is, you know, comes from trusted source, like it's been signed by Drupal.works keys. Uh, so you both know uh, that your site can update automatically, and uh, you know if someone changes DNS or some sort of man in the middle, middle attack, um, you're updating to something that Drupal.org has provided and, and signed, rather than um, you know there's been a couple other supply and change vulnerabilities where an attacker gets your automatic update system to download malicious code. And yeah. uh, that the framework is based on uh, a standard, uh, an open source uh, standard called the Update Framework, or TUF, T-U-F for short. We'll talk about it a little bit also in the Drupal.org panel tomorrow morning at 8.30, and I'm sure it'll get mentioned a little bit in this Automatic Updates panel as well. And one of the great things about it is, as we work together, partly funded by things like Drupal Steward um, and other collaborations, um, we've made a PHP TUF implementation that is also being explored uh, by Joomla, by Typo3, by other folks in the PHP ecosystem. And we're hoping to kind of present it as a prototype so that it could be integrated into Packagist itself and make the entire PHP ecosystem wow. done. So we're, we're trying to prove it out in Drupal and get, get the advantage of it. We hope to secure everybody else because that's in the spirit of open source. So given that I want to have time for q and I'm not going to actually take the time for people to answer this. Well, <laughs> apparently people are answer, answering it. I'm glad that so far everybody has said yes and not <laughs> what teeth. 
Um, <laughs> but you know, as we've mentioned earlier, we use this analogy around brushing your teeth as this security framework. And you know, I know lots of projects. I just got a bid for a project, and they literally had a line item for security work at the end of the project. And I'm like, no. Um, security is, is, the, is the type of thing that has to be built into your daily workflow. Every time you take an action in a site, you are potentially changing your security footprint in your attack surface by adding that module, by adding that third-party dependency, by integrating a JavaScript front end. You increase that surface area, which isn't necessarily you know, a reason not to do something, but you need to be aware of what those actions are. It's not enough at the end of the project to come back and be like, okay, what security holes did we create? Because now you're fighting a release date and fixing your security holes. And so we typically talk about this framework of, you know, every time you do something, just take the extra minute or two to figure out what your security impact is so that you're not trying to do this at the end. It is a lot more work to clean up a compromised site than it is to put a little bit of work in every week towards your site's security. Um, you know, there are lots of like best practices around security. I'm not going to get into those. There's, I think there may be, there's a history of presentations on security best practices, but you know, most of these are common sense. Have a password policy. Don't make your admin user, username admin and the password admin. Um, don't, you know, don't commit secrets to your database. Like there's all, there's all sorts of best practices around security, keeping your site up to date, running the, uh, running, if you're running critical infrastructure, making sure you've got the support in there to do it, making sure that your hosting is up to what your site is. Don't, you know, spend lots of money on a complex website and then host it on, you know, not performant hardware or not secure hardware. Um, you know, shared web hosting is one of my uh, things that comes up a lot. Like, if you're not doing shared web hosting right, every single server on that site is running as the same user account, and if one of them gets compromised, they can all be compromised. Um, ask for code reviews. Uh, this is like an easy thing to do. It's a great way to learn. Uh, ask for code reviews, either from a peer, from a consultant. Sharing your code on Drupal.org will get people doesn't happen overnight, but we'll get people to add comments to your code. Run a red team exercise where effectively you turn to a group of people who are not directly involved in your site and say, can you compromise this? And anything is on the table from doing that, from doing brute force attacks, trying to guess passwords, to social engineering. Um, figure out if you can get into your site. Put your patch Wednesday on your calendar. Uh, you know, just make sure you've got the time set aside just to look at the end of the day, what was released and does it impact our site? If you are interested in joining the security team, uh, there's a bunch of information on doing that at security.drupal.org slash join. And we will be here on Thursday for our contribution day. Come find one of us wearing one of the three flavors of hats. There's a blue version, a black version, I and a white version. I see four flavors here. Yes. And, and, uh, and a, <laughs> <laughs> and a yellow hat on the end. <laughs> um, but come find us. If you're interested in getting started or learning more, come find us. Uh, we do have about 10 minutes left, and I do want to have time for questions because this typically does take a Q&A standpoint. So Please. is anybody... Uh, either come up and borrow a microphone if you would like to ask a question, or we'll repeat it back. If yeah, you we'll, we'll repeat it. Yeah. So when traffic comes into well, Pantheon, what was the question? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. So the question was the, uh, the the individual has a site hosted on Pantheon. They're using a third-party web application firewall, in this case Cloudflare. And where does Drupal Stewart fit in? Thank you. Um, and the answer is that before your before traffic from the internet, whether it's being routed through Cloudflare or not, hits your website, Pantheon takes care of enforcing the rule. So it's built into Pantheon's stack above your uh, site itself. Correct. Yeah.
Yeah, so that is one of the problems with continually Any extending. Questions? I'm sorry, thank you. I'm really bad at repeating these questions. Um, question was, what about Drupal 7 end of life uh, and the, the ecosystem around Drupal 7, mostly contrib modules, falling out, falling out of PHP support? Uh, so there's, you know, some contrib modules don't support Drupal 7 uh, mm -hmm. in that space. Um, and the answer is, we're extending the support for core mostly. The contrib modules are still in the contrib modules hand and we don't have the resources to enforce that they get updated. We can't knock on a contributor's door and be like, you must update this. We can, we can take responsibility for core itself. So, you know, what does that actually translate to? It translates to you may need to actually watch that space to see if a module gets marked unsupported because the, the maintainer no longer is interested in maintaining Drupal 7 code, which most aren't. PHP uh, 7, Drupal 9 is the newest thing and going back and looking at the procedural oriented code of Drupal 7, not that interesting for a lot of people. Um, there are some vendors in this space that may be willing to step in and help there, um, but ultimately we can't force them to update. Drupal 7 is PHP 7 compliant. I think it's almost PHP 8 compliant. I'm not quite sure on that. Yeah, the, the intention is before Drupal 7 goes end of life to get it working on the latest versions of PHP and MySQL so that it can ride it out for a while. The other thing I would say about what Michael, M Michael's correct, mm. you can't, we can't force anyone to do anything. It's an open source community. However, if you have some modules that are strategically important to you, uh, if you, I don't know if the page is still called this, but it used to be called abandoned module process or something like that. There is a process for taking over a module and if you, you know, say you have to run a bunch of hacks in order to make it run on PHP 7.4 and the maintainer is AWOL, there's a process that you can follow to take over maintainership of that module. And it's pretty straightforward. It's like ping the maintainer a couple of ways, wait two weeks, if they don't respond, then file an issue. And then, you know, for the most part, especially if you're present in the issue queue helping you know, review patches and post things and stuff like that. It's a pretty easy process. And then that ensures that you don't have to run like a bevy of like custom hacks on top of the module. And then you could be part of the solution instead of kind of feeling like you're a victim waiting for, you know, somebody to show up and do something. There's also, a, uh, I've seen a lot of spaces where maintainers will say, you can maintain the seven code and we'll keep mm -hmm. maintaining the eight or nine code. So you don't actually have to take responsibility for all of it. And some maintainers are very open to saying, yeah, please help us. Um, and if you know, you've got a bunch of patches in the issue queue and the maintainer is not applying them and not allowing for um, you know, collaboration, talk to the DA. <laughs> <laughs> Any other Tim questions? And his ban no, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll help facilitate the process. They'll help facilitate the process. Any other questions, comments, or concerns? Yeah. So the question was, um, yes. <laughs> the question was, what, <laughs> easy crowd. Um, <laughs> the question was, what, what is the timeline for contrib maintainers to fix the issue? And there's not a set timeline on it. What the security team likes to see is activity happening on the issue at, at, at regular intervals. There are some really, really complex issues that take a while to resolve, um, especially, you know, when you've got a module that's been around for a while, it has a large use case, and you know the, the way the module is being used might actually be part of the security problem. There, there are sometimes times when issues can take you know, several months to actually figure out what are, the res what are the issues to resolve, how are we gonna go about doing this. What the security wants to, team wants to see is progress on the issue. And so we, you know, we formally say, I think, it's, I think it's a month, we typically give a lot longer, especially with COVID, but we wanna see that people are engaged, commenting on the issue, working towards a resolution. And when, when that doesn't happen, we go through our abandoned module process, which is why, back to Angie's point, if you do have contrib space modules that are vital to your use, become co-maintainers. You don't even have to be the primary maintainer. Ask to be a co-maintainer. Um, and one thing I'll add to that is like, 
you know, uh, often the security team will, if they do have to mark contrib modules as unsupported because of a vulnerability that isn't responded to, right, they might do a batch of those. And at that time, that's often when we see tons of people step forward and say, hey, wait, that's really important to me. I want to help. I want to get involved. Um, if you can, try and do that sooner. Part of your <laughs> weekly security practice can be, hey, is there anything we depend on that looks like maybe it doesn't have enough support, right? And, and you can slip in there so you don't have to be reacting after you suddenly get the scary red message that says you're using an unsupported module, so. Yeah. What, what flagging those modules as unsupported is an enormous amount of work. Going back and unflagging them as supported again is double the work. So if you can step in early, please do step in early. It makes this a much smoother process for everybody. Any other questions that I can remember to repeat? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There are some on Slido. Some on Slido, okay. What is, okay, so let me go through these in uh, order. Uh, should core and contributed modules support EOL versions of PHP asking for a friend? Um, <laughs> uh, so by default, core and contributed modules do support EOL versions of PHP because that's what they were built on. Um, you know, I think that core formally supports PHP 5.2. I think that's sorry, right. I, I think it's 5.2 or 5.3. Yeah, it's some yeah. very, very early version that we don't have automated tests that work for. Uh, it probably isn't supported very well. I think that if you're, you know, if you are running older versions of your stack, including old versions of PHP, yes, it's good to update core, but you probably have other security problems in there that aren't going to be solved just by updating core. So yes, you're going to resolve a highly critical issue by updating core, but you're not necessarily going to. Uh, like, gonna, gonna, you're, you're not necessarily safe by just updating core. Um, what is Drupal Stewart? Uh, what is Drupal Stewart? Is it only a service or more? Is it, open, is it an open source rule set? So I think Tim already answered this. Do you want to? Uh, yeah, I addressed this earlier. So again, the rule set itself we don't publish because it could be used to reverse engineer the vulnerabilities. It has to remain within the circle of trust, which is why it's operated as a service, which is why we have infrastructure costs, which is why there's an expense associated. But again, that's part of what we're using to finance things like the automatic updates effort to hopefully make it less necessary, right? Putting ourselves out of a job in that sense would be not so bad. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we, we can't release the, the rule set there. Uh, what's the recommendation to security review for internal code? Any automated way to do it? So there are lots of automated ways to do security reviews. Um, I, I, I am not going to repeat four letter words. Uh, <laughs> most of the time what they do is generate an enormous amount of, uh, of false positives. And then you spend a bunch of time chasing ghosts. Uh, that's not to say they don't have value. Where, where, where they're valuable to me is if you're running a secure version of Drupal and you run it and it changes the output, that might be worth investigating. So if you have run it and you get you know, 18 things and you've gone through the critical ones and you're like, yeah, these are all false positives, and you add a new module and now you have 19 things, that's probably something to look into. But the, the automated rule sets typically generate a lot of noise. Um, that's not to say they're bad, they're, they have a use, they're not the only thing you can do. You know, my, my favorite thing, I don't know if anybody's familiar with rubber duck debugging. <laughs> um, you can Google it. Uh, but effectively, talk through your code out loud or have someone else talk through your code to you and you will spot lots of things um, just by thinking through code in that, in that manner. Uh, also, you know, there are, serve, there are vendors that do this as their primary business model where they just do security reviews. Uh, finally, and then uh, also uh, just following general best practices, like use the database API rather than write your, write your own queries. And you know, if you use the APIs, uh, most of the time, what you're doing will be secure by default. Yes, that, that's absolutely correct. You use the use the APIs we have for databases, for text, for markup, all of it. And you get a lot because Drupal's a powerful platform on top of that. And, and there are pages on Drupal.org for developers describing how to write secure code in Drupal that talk about this in more detail. Uh, I think that's answered all of these questions. Uh, but it's hard to read and present because I'm looking down and I don't like doing that while talking. Uh, there's the uh, automated penetration testing. Yeah. That one. So automated penetration testing, we, we have played around with this using third party services. And what ends up happening is just the number of things that get reported that are 
false positives end up being too much signal to noise. One of the things that's been really, really productive in the past, if anybody has interest in funding it again, is we have done bug bounty programs uh, where we basically pay people to find security vulnerabilities. Uh, those are typically pretty good, but are expensive to run and they need a sponsor. So if you are interested in sponsoring it, please come talk to me. Uh, other than that, it is uh, 45 after the hour. I'm sorry, 15 after, <laughs> what do we, yeah. Five, we have five more minutes. Oh, we have five more minutes. So we have time for one more question <laughs> that I will repeat. <laughs> I do say that now. Any last questions? Well, I'm glad we've solved all the mysteries about security. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you.